very good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, good afternoon good evening in which or whichever part of the world you are uh, welcome to the central bank of the future conference and uh, uh, i am sachin shah i am going to present uh, my academic paper on fostering financial inclusion by enhanced aml kyc regimes using the star model uh, the star model is basically you know a, a thought uh, a thought process from my end uh which i think i'm going to uh, share with you all in in the coming few uh, uh slides uh, uh basically uh on 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 uh, uh giving a brief about myself i am a compliance professional with close to 20 years of experience uh, i am a subject matter enthusiast as well as the financial crime compliance uh, domain is concerned i have various global publications in my name uh, and i love to write you know as far as the financial crime uh, space is concerned uh, coming on my uh, topic which i am going to present today is basically on the fostering of financial inclusion and i am going to propose uh, or share the model you know which i have uh, come out on my own uh, so uh, coming on the brief agenda of this session i am going to cover uh, briefly about the financial inclusion uh, you know a, a very brief about the global perspective about financial inclusion what is the definition and all that after that uh, i'll move on to the very complicated and intricate nexus between the financial inclusion and the aml kyc regimes uh, i think it's very very important for all of us uh, you know to uh, correlate and to understand how the aml or kyc regimes are related to financial inclusion uh, i'll then move on to the current regimes uh, globally uh, you know and how they are promoting the financial inclusion uh, considering that and the challenges which we are facing i will then take you through the star model you know which i have proposed uh, in my academic paper uh, and again thanks to the university of michigan and the federal reserve bank of san francisco uh, to give me an opportunity to uh, share my model and then i'll wrap up my session uh, by uh, sharing the key takeaways uh, you know on my thoughts on the financial inclusion so yes in terms of uh, summarizing or giving you executive summary so as we all know that you know economic prosperity and financial inclusion you know go hand in hand uh, financial inclusion is 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 the focus area for all the uh, governments and uh, global regulators across the globe uh, we can understand uh, and the statistics basically support the fact that as on date the global gdp is close to 90 trillion us dollars and the global banking sector contributes close to 8 trillion dollars you know to the global gdp so we can understand you know how the global banking sector plays a pivotal role in the economic prosperity and how you know it impacts uh, the financial inclusion uh, definitely in terms of economic disparity uh, there uh, the top 1% of the richest owns nearly half of the world's wealth you know uh, which 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 is a cause of concern okay and these are certain things uh, which are related to financial inclusion and this is what i am going to uh, cover up in my subsequent slides uh, as we know uh, uh, that uh, the global banking sector and the financial service sector you know are changing dramatically over the past uh, few decades uh, parallelly the financial inclusion is also uh, getting the traction uh, barring few challenges uh, there is lot which has been done in the past uh, definitely in the coming future also governments are taking various steps but i think uh, the star model which i propose you know will definitely help the governments and it basically aims to help the governments and the regulators across the globe you know to enhance their uh, efforts in terms of uh, obtaining uh, more financial inclusion uh, the star model basically is an acronym of you know achieving safety and trust through improved aml monitoring and behaving responsibly uh, so basically the focus area is safety trust uh, aml monitoring and uh, behaving responsibly in other terms uh, we can say that uh, it's 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 a you know model which tries to strike a balance between socialism and capitalism by increased accessibility and improved responsibility so i think to address the issue of financial inclusion you know this paper aims to assess various governments uh, regulators and banking industry 
to adopt a futuristic approach in understanding and adopting the parameters of financial inclusion uh if you go on to the next slide you know and try to uh, have a deep dive uh, on the financial inclusion in the current scenario we will understand you know that uh, financial system plays a key role in achieving the global development and reducing income in, uh, inequalities uh, the increased penetration of financial system can help in poverty eradication by empowering the poorest of the poor financially uh, however there are uh, various challenges and the first and the foremost is you know how one defines financial inclusion you know there are divergent you know views about the financial inclusion there are various perspectives uh, there are various ways in which an individual governments regulators across the globe are viewing the concept of financial inclusion however if we uh, zero in on you know few uh, definitions by the world bank and the ftf will 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 clearly see that you know uh, financial inclusion in the most basic version is access to the basic banking okay this is something in a very layman term however you know to uh, see things in a holistic way that also includes a more holistic uh, you know approach and definitely should cover other sectors of financial systems like credit and insurance uh, definitely this is very important uh, 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 if if we see the recent report by city bank you know uh, and the report is termed as global perspectives uh, and solutions which was released somewhere in 2020 the report notes that over a long period of time financial inclusion discussion have in indicated that the topic is narrowly understood at best by many parties common misperceptions suggest that financial inclusion is only relevant in frontier and emerging economies or that it is only a problem for individuals so i think uh, one big problem is to understand the nuances of financial inclusion to understand what exactly the financial inclusion is and what we are trying to you know uh, approach at a global level so i think uh, when we talk about the financial inclusion uh, uh, this slide basically uh, uh, shows you uh, in a very crisp and short way that what uh, the financial inclusion means in a holistic way so basically uh, when we talk about financial inclusion it not only includes individuals but it, it also includes all other businesses you know uh, which involves making broader range of financial products and services available to individuals as well as to businesses uh, the other important point is on the accessibility and usefulness so when we talk about financial inclusion the accessibility and usefulness of the financial products is very very important if we are not able to uh, achieve these parameters the concept of financial inclusion you know uh, will not be that effective and fruitful the third point which is important is the affordability which is ensuring access to appropriate financial products and services at an affordable cost in a fair and transparent manner uh, so as uh, we all will understand that when we talk about the concept of affordability we somewhere attach a point of you know costing you know if uh, the services offered by the financial institutions and banks are very costly it's a costly proposition for the common man definitely it will not strike a you know repo uh, with the public and definitely it will impact the effectiveness so obvious obviously when we talk about the financial inclusion the affordability uh, is very much important and the last point is basically delivered in responsible and sustainable way so i think uh, the banks and the financial institutions across the globe you know need to be mindful of the fact that when they uh, you know uh, cooperate with the governments uh, across the globe in having more financial inclusion they need to deliver the financial services and the products in a responsible and sustainable way so i think this this gives us a clarity as to you know what the financial inclusion is uh, and i think uh, Uh, the regulators across the globe uh, are uh, circumventing their efforts keeping in mind you know these key characteristics as far as financial inclusion is concerned uh, uh i will i will briefly touch upon uh, this fatf guidance report which basically defined the financial inclusion and i think it it strikes uh, it strikes uh, everyone uh in terms of the coverage when we try to define the financial inclusion so it it basically says uh, you know that providing access to an adequate range of safe 
convenient and affordable financial services to disadvantaged and other vulnerable groups including low income rural and undocumented persons who have been undeserved or excluded from the formal financial sector so i think fatf has beautifully uh, defined uh, the financial inclusion uh, they have tried to cover all the aspects which we have uh, just touched upon in our previous slide uh, so they talk about uh, you know the safety the convenience the affordability the target groups are the disadvantaged and the vulnerable groups you know the low income rural and un undocumented so obviously uh, you know if uh, uh, if our efforts on financial inclusion are channelized uh, to target these vulnerable groups uh, definitely uh, that will be more effective moving on to the next uh, uh, slide uh, which basically will give us a snapshot on the current uh, scenario as far as the financial inclusion is concerned so we have come a, come a long way as far as the economic prosperity is concerned uh, however there are challenges uh, you know the income inequality we all can uh, you know uh, see that uh, in our day to day life there is plenty of material in the public domain which supports this fact uh, close to one third of adults uh, that is close to 1.7 billion Uh, of adults are still unbanked about half of unbanked people include women uh, who are uh, from poor households in rural areas uh, or who are out of workforce uh, the gender gap in account ownership remains stuck at 9 percentage point in developing countries hindering women from being able to effectively control their financial lives uh, so basically the point which i'm trying to make is that although uh, you know we have made progress in terms of economic growth uh, and uh, enhanced global gdp however there are pockets uh, across the globe who are still uh, you know way behind in terms of prosperity uh, these these key statistics support the fact you know that uh, they are really uh, supposed to catch up with the remaining world in terms of uh, eradicating the poverty and uh, you know uh, really making them financially more uh, uh, convenient and uh, independent Now, in terms of country uh, asia leads the world in terms of unbanked adults followed by africa in terms of absolute numbers uh, financial inclusion to other forms of financial services like borrowing savings products or insurance is also a pain point in several so sections of society in emerging countries like mexico peru and bangladesh so again uh, same point uh, which i just briefly touched upon uh, that financial inclusion doesn't restrict only to the basic banking services you know it it goes beyond the banking services it it covers the credit you know it covers the insurance sectors uh, and that is where uh, you know uh, it touches upon the lives of the most vulnerable sections of the society uh, so this is where you know efforts our our efforts has to be streamlined you know uh, as we can see 75% of the borrowings come from family sources informal money lenders or other sources so if we see the uh, global uh, uh, platform you know in terms of the lending facilities okay there is a very startling fact that 75% of borrowing still come from family sources or informal money lenders or other sources so this unorganized sector which still has a bigger uh, pie of the share you know they still control you know uh, 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 a lot of people you know in terms of their dependency as far as the borrowings are concerned and there is a cause of worry uh, cause of worry for all of us uh, though we have the organized sector in terms of banks you know uh, the money lenders and various other institutions giving their services but still there is lot to cover up you know in terms of including the vulnerable section of the societies you know uh, under our ambit and to increase the financial inclusion uh, the gaps result into economic growth which is non inclusive and also impacts the savings and consumption cycle so obviously uh, uh, when uh, there is so much inequality you know in terms of uh, income distribution obviously you know that results into economic growth which is non inclusive and which also impacts the savings and consumption cycle so we have seen in ample number of instances you know in the past uh, uh, you know where we have clear uh, instances where the savings and consumption cycles have been so disruptive you know that it really impacted the economic growth in big way 
uh, focus on financial inclusion helps people escape poverty by facilitating investments in their health education and businesses uh, so as as we just mentioned you know why financial inclusion is involved uh, is important it is in, it is important you know to assist people you know uh, people who belong to the vulnerable uh, class you know who are uh, not that lucky to access the uh, normal banking or other financial institutions you know to escape poverty uh, and how institutions help them they help them by facilitating investments in their health education and business and, and so on and so forth uh, it also makes it easier to manage financial emergencies such as job loss or crop failure that can push families into destitution so we need to understand you know that uh, though the financial services still contribute the major chunk of uh, of the global gdp but we have uh, people who are involved into uh, daily wage uh, jobs who are into agriculture and they are very much dependent upon the vagaries of uh, uh, the climate so basically in case of any eventuality if uh, we have a good financial inclusion definitely that will save them you know uh, in terms of financial emergencies as we just mentioned in case of job loss or crop failures i think uh, uh, the culmination of all these efforts you know to have increased financial inclusion uh, was attained uh, in the united nations sustainable development goals uh, so uh, this thing was been deliberated was been discussed for quite a big number of time but i think uh, the un sustainable development goals really prove uh, you know our efforts at a global level you know to have more financial inclusion uh, in terms of various uh, sustainable development goals there are seven uh, goals uh, uh, which are very important to be mentioned over here so we have the first goal which is on eradicating poverty Uh, the second goal is on ending hunger and achieving food security the third goal is on profiting health and well being <clears throat> the fifth goal is basically on achieving gender equality the eighth goal is on promoting economic growth and jobs the ninth goal is on supporting industry innovation and infrastructure and tenth goal is on reducing in inequality so out of uh, the whole uh, uh, gamut of uh, the united nations sustainable development goals i think these seven goals uh, you know proves uh, and demonstrates uh, the efforts which are being taken by the global community to have more financial inclusion and the steps which are being taken over a you know period of time uh, so yeah this is what uh, is 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 a very brief about the current scenario Uh, now we'll we'll uh, try to see that how the financial inclusion and the AML KYC regimes are you know interlinked. So, as we have discussed uh, a while back, you know that the global uh, uh, banking system uh, contributes a substantial chunk of uh, the global GDP, uh, and uh, 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 the way uh, the efforts have been taken, you know, to have more financial inclusion, it is expected that there will be unprecedented growth in financial inclusions. And by 2022, an additional 700 to 800 million adults will be included in the formal financial system, leaving just 15 percent of the global population unbanked down by from 49 percent. So I think we have seen uh, the efforts which are being taken uh, governments. Uh, across the globe uh, countries across the globe are uh, taking big steps you know in terms of attaining more financial inclusion and i think we'll definitely see the results in the coming few years uh, when uh, the number of people who are out of the formal financial system will drastically come down uh, in terms of uh, uh, the main four pillars uh, you know of the financial inclusion i think these are access affordability utility and legality i think we have discussed this uh, when we are uh, discussing uh, uh, the definition of financial inclusion when we just touched upon how the fatf and world bank has tried to define uh, the financial inclusion so i think uh, when uh, the governments across the globe are taking initiatives these key four pillars are very very important and in every approach you know uh, these four pillars has to be considered uh, to uh, make it more effective uh, however there are challenges in terms of attaining financial inclusion there are been efforts made by the regulators there are been efforts made by the governments but still we have challenges so what are those challenges these challenges are lack of insufficient funds we have stringent documentary requirements for availing services 
we have perceived cost of banking uh, distance and trust is another example so what what we what what we really mean you know when we say lack of insufficient funds so we need to understand you know that there are still uh, many countries who are really uh, falling short of the budgets okay which makes them very very difficult to have a national program or agenda on having a financial inclusion you know there are insufficient funds there can be many reasons for that but the bottom line is that they don't have funds you know maybe their priorities are different uh, that is why they are not able to focus on that and hence they are not uh, able to allocate the required budgets now, another thing is the stringent documentary requirements for availing services i think over a period of time the way regulators across the globe has come up and uh frame the regulatory uh, and the legal uh, regimes in terms of aml kyc you know it has become a big push and pull uh, sort of uh, you know tug war between the regulators and the uh, you know financial institutions you know because of the fear of penalties and various other uh, uh, you know uh, reasons uh, financial institutions are very very cautious when uh, the documentary requirements uh, uh, are concerned so they are still very very stringent in lot of countries there are countries you know who have made an effort to relax their documentary requirements which we'll see in the subsequent slides but there are still lot of countries in the in the world you know who really need to you know work on making the documentary requirements more simplified uh, the other reasons are perceived cost of banking obviously the way economy has uh, grown uh, you know uh, things are shaping up uh, the way sophistication is coming up the cost of banking is increasing day by day so obviously the financial institutions are very mindful of the cost benefit analysis and somewhere that is one of the deterrent you know to really push the concept of financial inclusion from their end although governments and regulators uh, really push them frame the frame the national policies but you know this is one thing which stops them in pushing uh, the you know achieving the financial inclusion big time then obviously distances and trust uh, so we need to understand you know that still uh, there are a lot of people who are you know residing in the rural areas uh, you know uh, the formal financial system is still restricted only to the major cities of the world you know still there is lot of work to be done you know to make these services available in the rural areas uh, there are organizations who have really worked upon it we have examples in front of us you know uh, various countries have taken a step uh, in terms of making these services available in the rural areas but still there is lot to be done in in the coming future uh, so just to support what you mentioned uh, so countries are realizing these challenges uh, the regulators uh, and the related bodies are realizing these challenges uh, and they have uh, taken steps with the help of regulators uh, legislative measures and financial sector reforms have been in initiated in some countries uh, so we have few countries uh, for example united states uh, uh, which basically uh, uh, came up with their community reinvestment act in 1997 which requires banks to offer credit throughout their entire area of operation and prohibits them from targeting only the rich neighborhoods so this is one effort which is done in united states in france if we take the example the law of ex the law on exclusion in 1998 emphasizes an individual's right to have a bank account in malaysia again you know uh, we can't compare uh, a country like malaysia vis a vis a country like united states and france but obviously when we talk about the financial inclusion you know uh, countries uh, are uh, taking steps uh, shoulder to shoulder and uh, malaysia is one of the country which really uh, made the concept of financial inclusion as one of their objective you know uh, in terms of financial inclusion legislations uh uh going back to uh, the african continent uh, the federal bank of nigeria basically came up with their microfinance uh, policy uh, in 2005 uh, in 2005 which basically targeted at bringing banking services at affordable cost to the doorsteps of the low income group uh, similarly uh, countries like senegal ghana the gambia mali burkina faso uh, and even the post conflict economies of liberia and sierra leone have undertaken financial sector reforms designed to promote the integration of the financial financial se uh, sector with the formal uh, 
no doubt uh, india definitely needs to be mentioned about that you know they came up with some very good products in terms of no fail accounts and you know general credit card for low deposit and credits so this shows the commitment of governments uh, and the countries to have more financial inclusion they are uh, taking steps uh, to achieve that uh, they have uh, uh, taken uh, various measures as we have you know just seen so i think we'll move on to the next uh, uh, stage uh, that what exactly are the challenges you know which the financial uh, institutions across the globe are you know facing when they are trying to uh, 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 achieve more financial inclusion so i think one of the biggest challenges is the increased cases of synthetic identity frauds the economic crimes cyber crimes you know which has demonstrated clearly that the vulnerability of the financial sector to the vagaries of financial crimes so we need to understand that the economic prosperity and the financial crime goes hand in hand okay on one hand you know we have sophisticated technologies we have uh, new avenues uh, to deliver the financial services to deliver the financial products at the same time criminals are also coming up big time where they are coming out you know with new and innovative uh, ways of uh, committing the crimes uh, and this has a big impact okay so uh, when a vulnerable section of the society is uh, is impacted by the synthetic identity frauds or economic crimes or cyber crimes that that is one big concern and it impacts uh, the financial inclusion effectiveness in big time you know which uh, all the countries and governments need to really focus on the other challenge is the lack of financial inclusion especially limited access to financial services the use of informal channels the prevalence of large informal service providers among others present difficulties in tracing and monitoring transactions and thus leads to a weaker aml cfd regime so i think uh, earlier in in one of the slides we mentioned that there is still a informal system you know which is uh, running parallelly with the formal system we have traditional money lenders you know who are uh, having a big uh, uh, penetration as far as uh, the population is concerned the trust level is very high okay so because of this parallel economy because of the unorganized sector you know which is having a bigger chunk of the share okay it is very very difficult you know to trace and monitor the transactions if something is uh, not going in a expected way now the third point is very imperative to understand accept the fact that aml cft standards promote financial sector integrity and soundness and support the fight against crime so i think somewhere governments and countries uh, still need to come up the curve as far as the understanding and accepting the fact that aml cft standards can really help them to promote financial sector integrity there is a very important requirement you know for uh majority of the governments you know to understand how the aml cft standards you know can really promote financial sector you know integrity uh to have more financial inclusion uh in in appropriate implementation of these standards especially in developing countries has been identified as one of the several factors for excluding almost half of the world population from formal financial services so i think in one of the uh, you know uh, uh, reports uh, somewhere it is mentioned that if the aml cft policies at a national level are not been you know uh, devised or formulated and implemented appropriately it has a negative consequence on uh, the objective of attaining uh, you know more financial inclusion Uh, again poorly designed aml cft controls have the tendency to deny the unserved majority access to the formal financial services undermine social and economic advancements and reduce regulatory and law enforcement capacity a key means of strengthening integrity so exactly the same point if uh, the unorganized sector has a major say you know in terms of offering the services uh, there are weak aml cft standards obviously you know it invites uh, uh, the criminals uh, to overpower uh, 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 you know uh, and penetrate uh, the population in a bigger way and this really uh, poses significant challenges for the governments and the law enforcement agencies to really push the concept of financial inclusion because obviously the criminals uh, and uh, the various type of uh, uh, you know crimes uh, will take a toll on their efforts uh, but definitely uh, 
uh, that is not the deterrent. Uh, governments, uh, countries are really committed to have more financial inclusion. Uh, and uh, I would like to share few of the countries, you know, uh, which have uh, really taken uh, very disruptive uh, and innovative steps as far as promoting the financial inclusion. So I think one of the key standards, uh, you know, is to simplify the customer, uh, you know, your customer requirements, how the customer due diligence has been undertaken, you know, how it has been customized for specific transactions, products or financial services. So I think if we have, you know, very uh, mindful policies, very simplified policies, very innovative policies, keeping in mind uh, the concept of financial inclusion, I think that will go a long way, you know, in attaining our objective. Uh, the current AML KYC regimes also supports the new financial services model and the new products, you know, like, uh, like mobile money and e-wallets. So I think uh, we just uh, discussed this, uh, that uh, with the increased use of technologies, with the innovative products, uh, definitely uh, the regulators across the globe are also catching up with, with their regulatory framework as to how we can ensure to support these uh, innovative financial products and at the same time we also achieve greater financial inclusion. One of the example is Central Bank of Mexico is a classic example which rolled out RTG system you know which allows banks to open accounts with only a smartphone so that customers do not have to visit a physical branch. Uh, we have uh, India again a classic example where they launched the unique identity system which is a biometric verification system and today they have covered almost 99 percent of the india's population and that really made uh, the financial inclusion uh, a big national agenda uh, again in brazil uh, the product the brazil brazil which is a no free checking account for lower income group which was introduced in 2007 similarly india also introduced the jandan yojana which was a no frill savings bank accounts we have Indonesia uh, who have uh, introduced the KYC approvals for new bank accounts without requiring face-to-face -face meetings. That is via mobile camera and all that. Pakistan is a country, you know, which uh, introduced tax intensive tax incentives were announced in 2019 budget for banks doing incremental lending to SMEs. We have Philippines who have introduced the national ID system to open bank accounts. So we have a whole gamut of countries, you know, who have taken major steps to achieve the uh, uh, major footprints in terms of having more financial inclusion. However, at the same time, there are still major pain points, you know, in terms of uh, uh, attaining financial inclusion. Uh, so these are lack of trust as uh, uh, we have seen that the online sector still uh, captures the bigger market share in terms of offering the financial services. We have countries who don't have, you know, the uh, uh, national identification infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, uh, countries where regulators are grappling up uh, with the concept of identity documents, especially in the concept of refugees and asylum seekers. So this is this is these are you know few uh, uh, you know uh, things which are coming up at the global level okay so there are there is a mass migration the number of refugees are increasing in some countries there are asylum seekers so governments are really pondering big time as to what kind of any documents can be really come up for you know making these uh, people under the ambit of uh, financial services and make the financial inclusion more effective uh, definitely uh, and not to mention lack of resources to implement aml safety monitoring program is another challenge so obviously government is doing its effort at the same time uh, there are institutions the public private partnership you know who are making efforts uh, to have proper controls uh, to monitor the money laundering and uh, countering for, uh, terrorist financing activities but they are facing challenges in terms of the required resources uh, in terms of uh, financials as well as a human power uh, resources uh, so again, uh, considering the pain points uh, which I just discussed, uh, these are basically the foundation of, uh, of my STAR model, uh, uh, which, uh, which in my view uh, is, is going to be very, very important. Uh, it focuses on a few key concepts, you know, which basically uh, are, are uh, derived through the pain points which we have just seen. So safety is one thing, trust is another thing, then we have AML monitoring and uh, 
uh, obviously the last one is behaving responsibly. So I will go on to uh, uh, you know explaining what the model exactly is. So this model basically uh, you know makes an attempt you know to come out with uh, some key takeaways which the governments and regulators across the globe can really follow you know to have uh, better financial inclusion uh, by uh, attaining safety uh, by having more trust of the public you know by having uh, in uh, incentivization for the contribution to financial inclusion by having uh, effective aml monitoring systems and obviously is uh, behaving responsibly uh, so uh, on your left hand side uh, these are the key points which talks about uh, create and enhance public trust in financial service sector uh, develop and improve national id infrastructure uh, regulatory relaxation the aml kyc process and framework incentivization to contribute in financial inclusion cost effective aml systems and subsidization enhancing framework for mitigating cyber frauds and synthetic identity thefts enhanced level of public private partnership so i think uh, the the key focus or objective of this star model is to really emphasize on the four pillars you know which is safety trust uh, aml monitoring and response and behaving responsibly i think if we all work in attaining these four pillars i think that will definitely help us out you know to give a push you know to our efforts in having more uh, financial inclusion uh, uh these are uh, you know uh, very brief about uh, the the seven point agenda of of the star model which is proposed by me so when we talk about creating and enhancing public trust in financial service sector you know what i mean to say is that you know we need to really push the organized sector uh, and see that why the unorganized sector is still a preferred option for the mass okay unless and until we don't uh, think about that thing we won't be able to push the financial inclusion there are advantages which have been offered by the unorganized sector uh, however there are advantages of the uh, formal financial system which we really we really need to push very hard you know we need to promote that you know we need to really market that thing and uh, you know gain the trust of the public uh, as per the consumer sentinel, sentinel network maintained by the federal trade commission there were 3 million identity and frauds reports received in 2018 so i think this also is playing a very very crucial role okay at, at on one hand we are trying to promote the financial inclusion on the other hand you know the increasing criminal activities are taking a toll on the finances and savings of the general public so unless and until we try we strike a balance you know we try to somehow come out with the relevant laws and regulations which you know in a way uh, make things more faster you know it makes things more expedited that is where you know we will be able to have more trust of the public and once we have more trust of the public you know we will be able to have more uh deeper penetration of the financial services and products and that way it will help us out to attain more financial inclusion the second point is you know to develop and improve national id infrastructure so i think somewhere in the past slides we have seen that there are countries who have uh, really worked hard and implemented the national id infrastructure for example india is one country where you know they launched the unique aadhar identification number you know which is a biometric uh, identity cards uh, this has really uh, 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 became a game changer as far as the indian economy is concerned government was able to uh, achieve lot of their uh, you know objectives in terms of reaching out to the poor eradicating poverty you know uh, uh by simply uh, following the national id infrastructure i think uh, countries uh, uh, which do not have the wherewithal you know or they are facing challenges in having a improved uh, national id infrastructure i think uh, they can look upon uh, the strategy and the approach which is being followed by countries like india and they can really go ahead and try to implement that and believe me it has its own advantages india is a classic example uh, uh, nothing to hide about that there is plenty of material uh, you know in, in the public domain which uh, you know supports that fact uh, the third uh, thing uh, which which is uh, important is the regulatory relaxation in the aml kyc process and the framework 
so i think uh, we we touched upon this fact you know that when a uh, regulatory framework uh, comes into the play uh, the requirements are still very very stringent you know uh, uh, clients you know or the general public when they try to avail the financial services they have to go through the barrage of you know documentational procedures uh, to some extent which discourages them i think uh, this is the point where the unorganized sector you know leverages uh, and try to penetrate uh, by having very less requirements uh, and offering their products but i think uh, uh, supporting regulatory changes like simplified due diligence you know uh, will really uh, help out the countries in going a long way as far as financial inclusion is concerned uh colombia egypt uh, honduras and india are some countries which have implemented the std regulations uh, keeping in mind the unbanked and the poor section of the society uh, so again uh, the, the regulatory relaxations in uh, in terms of the aml kyc process and framework will go a long way in uh, achieving our objective of having uh, greater financial inclusion incentivization to contribute in financial inclusion uh, this this is this is very interesting uh, you know which i would like to share with you i think we need to uh, see uh, that uh, the financial institutions and banks across uh, the countries and across the globe are uh, there to make profits uh, and when they do a cost benefit analysis somewhere you know that deters them you know to push uh, uh the larger picture of having more financial inclusion okay so governments must realize that financial institutions are assisting the ins- initiatives on financial inclusion in all the ways and also incurring huge cost to create and build the systems or products around it at the same time due to this cost benefit analysis <clears throat> a lot of financial institutions are hesitant to stretch themselves and increase either their network or products to reach the poorest of the poor of the society So I think I gave you a classic example, you know, which I uh, confronted a uh, few years back. So basically, we have one of the largest private sector bank, you know, uh, in India, and uh, uh, they were uh, opening uh, the accounts uh, for the deprived uh, section of the societies. Uh, so in one of the branches, you know, one of the RM basically called up the branch manager and said that. you know we have uh, uh, some 50 odd uh, uh, account opening forms with us and we will not be able to proceed because they have not mentioned that you know what is their source of funds and uh, you know, what is their source of income so basically <clears throat> when the concerned persons from the bank really uh, uh, went deep into uh, that case they uh, they noticed that all these 50 uh, people were the beggars you know they were staying on the streets uh, you know but still doing their best you know to be involved in the uh, larger uh, uh, ecosystem of the financial institutions but i think the way uh, uh, banks uh, are apprehensive of the regulations uh, obviously you know they they are apprehensive of opening these accounts so the point is uh, you know uh, we need to really focus uh, on incentivizing incentivizing uh, the financial institutions in contributing financial inclusion uh, this impacts the government initiatives to attain the deeper financial inclusion however it's high time government incentivizes the financial institutions to promote the financial inclusion and as i mentioned one such way is to offer some kind of tax deferment incentives to the financial institutions so that the increased cost of operations or compliance can be really absorbed uh, so i think uh, we just touched upon the case of pakistan you know which uh, announced the tax breaks in their 2019 budgets uh, the next point is the cost effective ams systems and subsidizations so i think we all uh, will accept the fact that uh, the financial institutions are incurring huge amount of cost when they are trying to implement the ams systems uh the cost runs into billions uh, of dollars uh, if we see the recent statistics so i think somewhere uh, governments needs to step in and if uh, some kind of solution can be worked around where uh, you know they can really subsidize uh, the cost which is been incurred by the financial institutions i think that will really help them not only to reduce their cost but it will also you know um, uh, you know encourage them to show their interest for greater financial inclusion the next point is enhancing framework for mitigating cyber fraud and synthetic identity thefts so i think again the same point you know uh, when we talk about financial inclusion uh, 
uh, we also need to see that why uh, or what are the concerns of the public you know uh, or of what a common man thinks you know what is a fear in his mind okay the, the biggest fear is that if i am saving something you know and if uh, if i lose that saving then what okay who will come to my rescue will the government have uh, proper regulations you know who can save my accounts are there any laws in in place you know which can help me to recover uh, uh, those savings so i think these are certain things uh, which governments really need to work upon uh, definitely there are countries who have worked upon but i think there is still lot of scope you know to work on 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 these uh, 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 aspects uh, uh just to summarize on the star model which i have proposed uh the key takeaways you know are the seven uh, uh, uh steps we need to create an enhanced public trust in financial services sector we need to develop an improving in, in national id infrastructure the third is regulatory relaxation in the aml kyc process and framework the fourth is incentivization to contribute in financial inclusion the fifth is cost effective aml systems and subsidization the sixth one is enhancing framework for mitigating cyber fraud and synthetic identity fraud and the last one is enhanced level of public private uh, partnership so i think uh, uh, if we follow uh, these uh, uh, key seven uh, you know things uh, from this star model i am sure uh, governments uh, and the regulators across the globe you know we will, will be able to uh, attain their objective of having an increased financial effectiveness in in a much effective uh, way uh what is a call to action for the governments and the regulators across the globe the call to action is to understand that social welfare impact of financial inclusion is significant they we need to realize that to bring in more unbanked and poor people into the formal financial system has its own advantages uh, pursuing the enhanced levels of financial inclusion and the combating of money laundering and terrorist financing can and should be viewed as complementary national policy objectives uh facilitating growth with equity reduce income inequality promoting safe savings along with access to reliable services and making financial transactions easier and ultimately eradicating poverty so the bottom line is that uh, by fostering uh, uh, the enhanced aml kyc regimes you know we can definitely have more financial inclusion it is definitely a challenge but it is not that difficult so i think uh, uh, with this i conclude my presentation i again thank uh, the host and the co-host of the conference and will be happy to take any questions so so over to you mr singh if you have any questions we'll be happy to uh, address those questions that's terrific thank you so much mr shah for that i um yeah. want to encourage our viewers to download and read mr shah's paper which is located on the engagement hub you can see the link to it um, I want to be mindful of time, but I do have just a couple questions for you. Um, you mentioned earlier as an example of relaxing some of the regulatory um, parts of AML, KYC, um, simplified due diligence, and, and you have obviously done a lot of reading about examples of that, and you mentioned Colombia, Egypt, the Honduras, and I'm just curious if you could say a little bit more about what um, simplified due diligence looks like for those of us who have not are, are newer to the AML KYC space. Yeah, sure, Miss Christine. I think uh, that's a very good question. So I think uh, when we talk about the simplified due diligence, okay, uh, the very important fact you know which needs to be kept in mind is that you know uh, the requirement of uh, you know documents uh, by the common man you know or in technical terms we we term that them as as a customers of the of the financial institution should be very very minimal okay so for example uh, if we see the current uh, 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 customer due diligence and kyc regimes across the globe whenever uh, you know a common man goes to uh, the financial institutions they have to produce uh, you know a lot of documents so proof of proof of identity is one of them they need to produce their uh, you know address proof they they need to produce their uh, photographs you know they need to produce their source of income and so and so forth so basically the way the global landscape is changing you know as i mentioned somewhere we have you know new type of uh, uh, you know challenges uh, 
uh, coming up at the global uh, level so we have refugees you know we have asylum seekers who really don't have you know documents or if even if they have documents you know they may not be accepted you know by the other countries you know where they are moving or migrating or where they are seeking the asylum so uh, the point is uh, when we talk about simplified due diligence uh, the expectation is that by having a bare minimum set of documents you know that person should be able to have an association with that bank you know uh, that might be you know you just ask them you know, a, a simple photograph okay or you just ask them okay fine you give me your identity proof and then you open their bank accounts so i think that will really go a long way uh to give you example i think india is again one one example where uh, these jandhan accounts uh, was one major initiative taken by uh, the indian government and that really helped you know the poor people you know to come and open their accounts they were really brought into the mainstream you know of the formal financial system so i think that will really help you know when you bring the poorest of the poor you know the people who are you know uh, 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 really facing challenges you know uh, if they come into the mainstream definitely it has its own impact you know which governments and countries will realize over a period of time um and then for my final question um you mentioned earlier that you believe that financial inclusion should be more holistic to include credit and insurance i'm curious to hear what role you think the central banks could play if any um in expanding into the world of insurance yeah uh, again a very uh, uh, you know good question so i think when we talk about uh, the holistic approach to be followed by the central banks you know i think it is very important to understand uh, you know uh, the nitty gritties and the role it plays so as you just mentioned insurance now, insurance is uh, you know one uh, good product which really can help out uh, the uh, the common man you know in case of its uh, you know when there is a emergency so i think if uh, the uh, central governments across the countries really come up you know with such kind of uh, regulations you know or changes or uh, something innovative you know which really encourage you know the common man to really come and join the formal uh, uh, you know uh, uh, financial services sector it will really help them you know as of now there are a lot of challenges so what is required is that central governments need to really understand and i think i have mentioned this earlier also one thing which we need to really understand and really need to ponder that why is it so that a common man you know prefers to go to a local money lender okay rather than going to a bank you know for his normal requirements you go to rural areas okay we have bangladesh you know as an example we have african countries uh, we have lot of south asia pacific countries where public at large still prefers to go to you know uh, unorganized sector and that is where the challenge is so i think if the central banks across the globe really think and sit you know that why is it is happening is it is it an issue of trust is it an issue of policy is it an issue of affordability is it an issue of you know uh, some kind of apprehensions in terms of uh, you know having appropriate regulations and all that i think once they deliberate that you know and come up with 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 uh, you know covering or uh, you know having a proper control system to cover these things i think that will really help help uh, uh, everyone it will be a win win situation at the end of uh, the day terrific sachin shah thank you so much for your presentation today yeah, thank you. um i encourage you again the full length paper is available in the engagement hub please do download it read it cite it Uh thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Mr. Stee and have a nice day. You too.